All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you from a very hot San Diego. We have a bit of a heat wave going on, so it's extremely hot here right now. And today I am joined by Sue Firth, who is in Guildford, uh, just outside London in the UK. It's 10.30 in the evening there, so I'm assuming it's a little chillier. Hopefully. Yes, actually, thanks. We've had a really great heat wave, but we're getting cooler now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to 10.30 tonight, to be honest, uh, when we might get a bit of respite. I don't mean, I, I can't really complain about the weather here because people don't really want to hear you complaining about the weather in San Diego when it's summer all year round, so I'm not going to do that. Um, so Sue is a performance coach and business psychologist, yeah. and she has a background in stress and change change and stress, you know, they tend to go hand in hand. And obviously right now, uh, given the situation that we're in with the, you know, the global pandemic, uh, there's obviously a lot of stress going around and there's a lot of pressure on leadership and how to handle it and how to emerge from this and, and deal deal with whatever, the I hate that new normal phrase, so whatever mm. the reality is for everybody when they come out. Uh, so, um, so let's talk about uh, managing stress and coping with stress from a leadership point of view in in coming out of this pandemic and then afterwards, what are some of the challenges that are facing leaders in in not letting the stress that they are under kind of translate to everybody around them? I think I think that's a very fair point. I mean, leaders in general think very differently. They tend to approach situations without particularly registering stress for the most part. Normally, that's because they're very uh, adrenaline focused, very driven and very capable individuals who basically live outside of their comfort zone anyway. So when they do that, they're not really going to register that as stressful the same way as other people will do. The problem with COVID is it's thrown many of them up against it. They are very significantly pushed. They're, they're now having to think genuinely, what's going to happen? How do I plan? And of course, they're also very goal oriented individuals. I would mm -hmm. say the most sensible thing to do, which they're probably doing anyway, is press the reset button, take some time to work out what you think this newer form of your business is potentially going to look like, bring your people on board as much as possible, and um, basically establish a short sense of goals, so only mm -hmm. fairly short term for now. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point to, to stress for everybody because I think, uh, I mean, gone are the days of right now of doing your one, two, three year plans right now. You have to plan in manageable increments because there are so many variables at play. Absolutely. And I don't think any of us, and this is probably part of the difficulty, none of us can read this situation particularly well. And as you're probably experiencing spikes, we're also at risk of getting them. Nobody really knows what it is that we can do that could anticipate this from the point of view of totally knowing what's mm -hmm. going to happen. I think we're all making common sense approach and choices. And I think that's that's always going to be sensible. But many of them are going to be more anxious and not necessarily have anyone to talk to. So I think the days when they used to feel it was okay to be just a little bit vulnerable aren't so easy right now. They've got to show that backbone in order to be able to bring on those employees, really. Yeah, and obviously a lot of them have to do this now in a new way than before, uh, in terms of maybe their whole organization is is virtual, maybe, you know, yeah. globally, yeah. geographically and often dispersed. Leaner. Mm. And often yeah. leaner. Mm. Uh, but, but with that comes in many ways, um, we know this from experience because we've run a largely virtual company for many, many years and we made a strategic decision to do so. But one of the things that comes with it means you have to be exceptionally good at communicating and you have to err on the over-communication side. Yes, I think I think really to manage change, there's always been a simple principle, which is the sure. more personal the message, the better. And mm -hmm. I think gone are the days when we could afford to simply be able to send something out by a generic email and assume that that would help people feel secure or stable in this situation. I think the frequency with which you communicate, the methodology that you use, the fact that we have all needed to make a flexible transition to being online, you know, just because you can't be with somebody doesn't mean that you can't connect well with them. Mm -hmm. You would know this much better than than many. And that's exactly how you still build rapport and stay in touch with your employees. You have to tell them the truth as you know it, but equally, perhaps not so much detail that you scare them all the time. <laughs> 
So it's about, it's about little and often, and it's about keeping it personal and keeping it as sensible as your team really need. And that's what you'll know more than anyone else will. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting uh, when you do operate virtually. That uh, and I and I, I always uh, call myself a kind of reform smoker when it comes to this kind of thing because when I ran companies a number of years back, I couldn't stand the thought of people working from home. I thought needed to be in the office, all of this. And then when mm-hmm. things evolved and all of that, now I find that it, you can actually make. Um, in some ways, deeper connections with people that you never meet. Um, and you can have a better flow of communication. There's something about it that when you do it properly, it works It works really well. Um, and I think on that point, then, I guess the other part that leaders have to show is they have to show that they're able to be adaptable and versatile. And that means also allowing some flexibility with their workforce because people have different situations now that they're at home. One person may have a great yeah. home office. Maybe they don't have kids or whatever. Another person may have a house that's full of marauding kids because they you know, can't go to school. So you have to be more kind of flexible. You do. And I think you're absolutely right. There's probably a couple of observations I would make then, really. The the days when we used to struggle managing a virtual team are now becoming the norm. It now mm. needs to be something that you accept as part of your remit or brief and actually just get as natural as possible and get as comfortable as possible and forget about the fact that you're on camera, you're talking to a yeah, person. Sure. I think. I think that's pretty vital. And I think the second thing is it gets a little bit of a struggle working out how to register productivity because you're not there, you can't see it, you don't know how much work people are doing. You have to have an element of trust and acceptance that this is the way to do it now. Yeah, and I think that almost forces you to manage by results. And I think that's the way you should manage normally, but it often doesn't happen because uh, maybe you haven't defined outcomes well enough. Maybe you haven't got the right, you know, KPIs and goals and measurements in place. I think now it's critical that you put those in place because then you can manage to results. And and when you manage to results, then it takes away a lot of the, uh, you know, noise in your head about are they really working? What are they doing? Because if they're delivering what you're looking for them to deliver, well, you shouldn't really care. Well, also, it takes away the stress for the employees themselves because they tend to know how it is they're being benchmarked or measured in some way. And there is still some logic in the fact that that toolkit needs to be out there and they need to understand what's expected Mm -hmm. of them. So regular communication and regular KPIs. And you can still set those, I think, because they're still important. They're still how you would run the business. So fundamentally, there are some things that haven't changed. Managing Mm -hmm. people is still critical and the same pieces of the jigsaw puzzle still apply. So I think some of it feels very new, but some of it's actually very familiar. Yeah. And in many ways, I think maybe it it seems familiar because maybe it's something that you used to do really well, but you had maybe not done as much of, and now you're forced back into doing it. And it's probably a good discipline to be perfectly honest. Yeah, you're right. You're going, and, and to some degree, you have to go back to management basics. Mm-hmm. But also, it's not just about management; it's about leadership. And I think I think this will differentiate the difference between the two, where we are probably very capable at being leaders because we think it's all about strategy. We can no longer necessarily rely on a strategy. You have to get the basics and back to management and getting your team on board. Yeah. And, and particularly as you said, I mean, because, you know, strategy may be um, maybe a three month window. So it's it's it can be evolving and it can be changing a lot. So when you're in, as you would know better than me, though, when you're in a situation of constant fluctuation and change, that's a recipe for stress as opposed, mm. you know, and, pe- and people feel very discombobulated, if you like. So somehow the leader has to show that, Yes, it may be a fluctuating situation. We may only be able to plan three months out, but there are still some uh, fundamentals that are there. There are still some things that we have control over, and those are the things that we should focus on. That's it, and you're you're spot on. Those are the things that we can truly influence. Those are the things that we still have control of. And I think recognizing that actually control, particularly during a time of flux or change, is is a vital ingredient. It's particularly important for executives and leaders. They tend to like specific control of their lives. This is one of the reasons why they will be quite stressed at the moment. But as you so beautifully say, if they can anchor themselves with those parts of the way their business works, which is much the same as it's always been they will stay in control of that which they can and and that's going to be important 
So what are, what are some other ways that you would advise leaders to where they could reduce their, their stress levels, you know, given, as we said, I mean, this is such a, a fluctuating situation. Yeah, well, truthfully, it's a, it's a little mix between them. I mean, individuals themselves often tend to follow some kind of toolkit of their own, which if they apply mm-hmm. pretty consistently, they will probably find us some fairly good stress management principles in there. I think it's still important that you get some exercise, particularly because we're now more at home and we're more sitting down. Mm-hmm. I still think it's fairly vital that you get some time to yourself and you get breaks and you get change and you pace your day. Nobody needs to know where you are 24 seven. So putting in meetings back to back, especially Zoom meetings are quite exhausting. That wouldn't be a good thing. I still think it's very important for them to invest in time with their peers. So other leaders so that they can share intellectual property, pick up ideas, maybe download about a problem so that they can pick up problem solving skills for that situation and be specific about that situation as opposed to I really don't know what I feel is right here. And where their employees are concerned, I think you have to model that behavior as best Mm -hmm. as possible. It's no longer relevant whether you come in at six, seven or eight in the morning and leave at six or seven at night. But it might be quite important that you pay attention to how people are and how they're feeling. And setting up some stress management skill through your management team is quite important so they can help too. Yeah, I mean, I love that idea of modeling because I do think that that is the, that's something that not everybody realizes. I mean, people, and, and we know in the world we live in today, people are always shouting at each other and calling each other stupid and trying to change. And you say, well, you, nobody's, nobody's mind has ever changed by that. They're changed by modeled behavior. When they see somebody acting in a particular way that seems to be positive and all of that, then they take notice of it. So to your point, I think, uh, you know, leaders modeling uh, behavior and showing that um yeah don't be consumed always with the negative you know and the and the doom and gloom news i mean you no. can, there's enough of that about we know it's there and you can check it you know once a day if you really need to but there's no point in focusing there no and you're and you're spot on i think you know you don't have to have all of the answers all of the time but i do think having some sort of strategy plan and mm-hmm. short-term goals are the way to hold it together and that's what the team will try and follow. And that's what they will be able to model. And then when they go out and cascade that, whether it's to clients or whether it's to their employees, that that's how the business then you know, tries to follow some kind of, if you like, guide or, or direction. And there still has to be some sense of where that direction is going. But as you quite rightly said, they've still got to be flexible enough to cope with the change because mm-hmm. it's a fluid situation right now. And I think there's something also to be said for encouraging people to dig in and find their sense of resilience, because I think that's something that people that that people will uh, emotionally attach to is this idea of resilience, because there's so many things thrown at us during the course of our lives anyway, anyway, that if you can get your company to coalesce around the fact, okay, we're going to get through this, we're going to be resilient, we're going to stick at it, we're going to face whatever obstacles come up. I think that's something that that people inherently are drawn to. Yes, and I agree. And I think I've always tried to suggest with all the groups that I've been presenting to, particularly on Zoom in this last (laughs) few months, if you can find a one-line mantra of some form that people can connect with, it'll give them a reason to kick their legs out of bed and still feel connected with the business. For example, something quite strong and positive, we're not in this alone, or we want victory, not just survival, or let's stay focused, we'll win. Something which, although it may seem a little trite as you and I are talking about it, Mm -hmm. that's what people want to hear, because it's more about the fact that you've thought about the masses and your your lovely team, and you're saying something energizing, and it's okay, it's going to be okay, or it's going to be as good as we can possibly make it. We will get through this. Those kinds of things tend to keep people in a positive mindset yeah you know, and, and sometimes belief is all that you have and uh, and a really healthy sense of okay you know i believe we're going to get through this now not to not to the point of where you're you know, got your head in the sand and you're being delusional but i do think that positive idea of belief saying you know that we will find a way through it you we're, we're a bunch of smart people we haven't come this far to to That's let it. something like this knock away. us Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think there's there's always been some theories or principles, simple principles about business, which haven't changed. If we can't get 
what we're doing or what we're selling right now. Let's diversify. Let's make yeah. intelligent choices. Let's see what else is out there. And there are silver linings. There are if you go looking for them. You know, I've been able to turn the majority of my speaking onto online without it being particularly mm-hmm. difficult. And frankly, the kind of coaching that I do in the US, no one would expect to meet me face to face anyway. Right. So yeah. it's not really been too much of a shock to my system. And they've adapted. And I'm quite grateful for that. So if I go into that with a positive set and similarly anybody I'm supporting, I think their performance is likely to improve and they get less scared. Yeah, and I agree with you. And I think uh, in most businesses, that's the thing to do is to look, okay, if your core business maybe is suffering, maybe there's adjacent things that you go into. Maybe there's a traditional uh, market segment or vertical you sell into that's not doing well. Well, maybe now's the time to explore some of the ones that are, are doing well. I mean, to be honest, I mean, right now there's some market segments and verticals that are booming and, yeah. you know, and there's some that are in the horror. So, yeah. but yeah. there's there's opportunity there if you want to go look for it. I think you're right. And I, and it can be in very unexpected places. Mm-hmm. I mean, it isn't it isn't wrong to think so, OK, if hospitals need certain materials or they need certain not. PPE and we might be a supplier of that, can we come up with that? Or if we make yeah. plastics, can we produce visors? You know, we're still coming up with gear which people need. And this is very mm-hmm. important. I mean, I, I probably don't sound like I've done anything desperately sensible when I say I've written a book, but actually... I've written my third book during this time Excellent. and relationships are never going to go away no matter what we're going through. So to me, it was a good yeah. choice of subject just because I didn't write about COVID. You know, to me, that yeah. was quite, it was quite pertinent because that's what life is about. It's still about relationships. And I think that's the other thing. I think that uh, if you want to look for silver lining and all of this, I think it has given people a little bit more time for reflection, maybe a little bit more time to to step outside of what they're doing. Maybe it, maybe if there are people who are being forced to work from home, who've never done it before, have found that you know going running at lunchtime or going for a walk it's is actually a, yeah yeah maybe spending maybe spending your lunchtime with your kids is is something that's very energizing and all of that. Maybe there's so many things that. And like you said, maybe maybe that was the time to start on your book or maybe do a little bit of writing, whatever, but read, you know, nourish your mind. Uh, I, I think there's so many things that I don't think when this is over, that maybe you shouldn't let go of all of it. Try not to. And I would agree with you. And there are, for example, female executives that I speak to who have been so used to rushing off the train and Mm -hmm. popping their kids into nursery and then powering in somewhere else and feeling exhausted before the days even started. And they are absolutely relieved they don't have to do that right now. Mm -hmm. So there are there are ways in which you can take a moment to hover above and work out what has this taught me? What's going well? What have I enjoyed? And, you know, maybe if you're a male exec, golfing furlough hasn't necessarily been the answer, (laughs) but it's quite possible that if at one moment during that time it gave you a chance to reflect on what you're enjoying or what life is really about, that cannot be a bad thing. Uh, beautiful. I think that's a perfect, uh, perfect note to end on, Sue. So all of Sue's information will be in uh, her contributor bio below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, thank you. Um, Being a business psychologist really means that I'm an expert in how people tick and how they think. And where it's really quite relevant is if we ever get stuck in life and it never feels very good when you do. And obviously at any stage in life, this can happen. So sometimes you need a bit of help and a helping hand is always a good thing. So I'm out there and that's what I do. And I enjoy supporting you. So if you need me, you know, thank you very much for your time, really. Yeah, um, this is fantastic. And I and I do encourage people, I say this all the time, that I think, uh, you, you mentioned golf a few minutes ago, I, I always think that it's amazing how much money and time most of us will invest in our hobbies. Uh, but we won't invest time and money in the things that put bread on our table. So like getting it, like getting a, a professional coach, somebody who can really help us. So I think maybe next time you're looking at your your budget, maybe say, okay, I can do with a few less golf lessons and maybe I want to spend some time with Sue or one of or another coach. Oh, thank you, Sam. That's very kind. That's very right. useful. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Listen, thanks, everybody. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.